Um, so real quick, uh, just, just who I am. Um, so I'm the VP of Manufacturing Technology at uh, AMT. Uh, AMT is the Association for Manufacturing Technology. So our, our members are the folks that are building uh, machine tools, control systems, including additive and 3D printers and equipment, uh, the advanced materials. So not just folks making billets of uh, steel or stuff, but folks who are making um, exotic alloys or some of the advanced polymers and matrix systems for things like additive. Um, so we're in the crux of, of some of the manufacturing technology, and, uh, you know, this is the stuff that people use to make stuff, right? And um, <clears throat> so prior to AMT, the reason I, I kind of got into to additive in the first place was uh, I was leading the technology thrust for Northrop Grumman on aerospace systems and space park. So we did uh, a lot of work in metals, titanium, TIE-64, did a lot of work in um, peaks and PEC and that family. Um, so some of the, the higher end polymers, uh, a lot of the carbon composite polymers as well. So we had a little bit of matrices involved and those were going on um, platforms and, and parts such as uh, F-18, F-35, Global Hawk and a couple other special programs. So, you know, I did that for about seven years and um, really enjoyed it, just, just really enjoyed it. And that was one of a few technologies that I had in my, my portfolio. And uh, but anyway, got a lot uh, to uh, a lot of experience talking with government, obviously, uh, but a lot with the universities and then a lot with NSF and working with America Makes. So I still sit on the executive committee for America Makes, which is the National Additive Manufacturing Innovation Institute. Um, <clears throat> so I, and I've seen the bill of who you guys have talked to uh, or have listened to up to this point. You guys got a great, <laughs> great agenda, man. Uh, a lot of a lot of great names, great friends on that list. And there's some more to come. So the one thing I tried to do for today is just think, you know, what, what's the slight different perspective that I could provide from an AMT and industry, you know, side of things. And and are are there some areas where maybe it's a it's a gap that uh, hasn't quite been talked about in a certain way, or is it some expectation, um, even levels of hype? And I think the people prior to me addressed a little bit of the hype, you know, there, there's hype and there's reality. So I'm not gonna go too much into that, but just with a little bit more of an industrial flavor, especially with the the manufacturing technology background that I have now, as far as the equipment and the control systems go. So with this, it's you know, we're in the middle of a political season. It just seemed appropriate point counterpoint. And, and the way this is gonna run, you know, I've just got a couple things that you have either heard in the headlines, you might've uh, seen or, or listen to people talk about on just one singular perspective, or there might be an area that you just didn't think about. And I want to kind of throw that out to you and then give you the counterpoint. Uh, what's the counterpoint? The counterpoint is not always just reality, but it is a bit of now you know, so when you go make another decision, you're a little bit wiser, right? And, that, and that's, that's the whole deal. You know, when you're in school, you're a sponge and you're just taking everything in. And eventually you got to take that sponge and the knowledge you've you've accumulated and, and, and wring out <laughs> some kind of profit. Even in the nonprofit world, it's not like you're not making some kind of money somewhere. So it's very few times that you will not have a business case for what you have in your head uh, to make a living, or at least contribute to making that living. So that's kind of what today is. Um, when I think of, of the agenda, it's really three things that I want to kind of talk about added manufacturing. I want to say, you know, what, what does it take? for additive to, to really outlive the hype. And, and we're coming, if you haven't noticed, we're coming down the hype curve a little bit. There's been a lot in the last three to five years was, you know, probably two years ago was the tremendous peak. We had tons of magazine covers, high-end high magazine covers, um, tons of industrial stories, tons of white papers, uh, a lot of grants, uh, just a lot of stuff in the additive world, and, and, and rightly so. But how do you outlive that hype? There's been no technology, by the way, uh, to date that has not come down off off a hype curve. Some still survive that hype curve and they continue to go back up and do some things in the commercial world that are astounding. So you kind of want to pick apart what, what makes those different. How do you outlive that hype curve? Uh, and the second thing is, is if additive is doing so well, and it is, um, and it has such a high potential, and it does, then what what could derail it? Uh, you know, Why is this thing just not an an autonomous infinite flywheel, and, and we've already got the momentum started, and we just stand back, and it, and it does what it does. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And at the end of the day, there is a little bit of a reality check, not just about the hype, but more about where additive plays in the whole manufacturing technology um, sector. 
So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, keep an eye on the clock. So, you know, th this hype thing, it, it's great, quite honestly. You, you kind of want it. <laughs> You'd rather be in a world where your technology is being hyped that you're researching or learning than not, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, but there are a few things that are going to keep that potential from really blossoming into what it could be. And, you know, these are three easy things here. It's really the embrace of standards. And, and it's unfortunate that standards can be pretty boring outright. I mean, there it's a document. Sometimes it's guidelines. Sometimes it's procedures. Uh, and that's what you're checking off, that you're doing those kinds of things. But there's also some areas and standards where how materials, for example, in additive, how materials are prepared, how they get maybe uh, treated, conditioned. Uh, then there there are how do you start, and they haven't got all these completely vetted out yet. And there's about three, four you know industries, we call them SDOs, standard development organizations, three to four different SDOs that have little bits and pieces. Now we're having a big effort of, of America makes is how do you make all these standards coherent? And how can you reference them the right way so that not everyone's doing the same thing twice and all this different stuff. But there's some coming down the pipe that allow you to uh, data type. So if, you, if you're familiar with XML coding, HTML and stuff like that, especially with XML, you, if you get the right data types for things like sensors, input outputs, if you get uh, the right data types and, and the right uh, name for a material and its relationship with the process and that whole relationship to the end quality of the part, well, now you can take all that data off of these additive machines and not just do some in situ uh, metrology or inspection so you, you can you know, real time adjust to make sure your part's good. You're gathering all this data real time and it's getting associated back to the part that's being fabricated. And you could do it across any maker model of machine, across any process of those machines, and to an extent, accommodate any kind of material. And it's the same XML data packet that gets produced. And if you're a coder up, upstream, up the protocol stack, you can do a lot with that. So, I mean, there's these things about standards that are not just about that I follow a, a particular process. Those, those are important. It's a lot more about how all these standards are going to work together and how we get standards that will normalize uh, the use of different makes and models of machines, different uses of materials. And if you're in the industrial sector and you're trying to write a spec for what you want, you really don't want to have to go and spec out a particular make and model of machine, a particular control system, a particular material, all these different things. You want to be able to spec out the part, the end, the end product. Um, but there's a lot of things like standards that have to be there at first. Um, another thing is is on the machine tool side. This is a, a a bit of a comparison. When you look at machine tools, you know mills, lathes, um, you know, polishers, grinders, all these different things, lasers uh, for etching or for cutting. All these machine tools have contractual warranties that say it will be available or it will have a particular uptime in percentages. And, and it's high. I mean, it's like 98, 99%. Sometimes it even gets in the decimals, two decimal places. And then there's a whole list of things that say what uptime means, what availability means. And if you've ever worked with a piece of additive equipment, um, I could probably just stop there. But uh, you, you'll know the rest of my sentence when it comes to the comparison to additive. Um, that kind of reliability is not there. And it certainly isn't there on a first part or on the first run or even on the first sets of runs. Uh, if you ever had a chance to listen to Greg Morris, you know, when he was at Morris and they were before they were bought out, um, he did a lot to that machine and that material before he ever had his process set. And even then he didn't necessarily have a hundred percent right all the time. And his machine certainly wasn't up 95 or 98% of the time. So some people say, well, you know, I added is gonna do all this stuff and change the world and it will if, right, and the if is, can it be more reliable? Because that's what people expect out of the industrial technology world. And that's that's a tough bill to fill. Um, there's a lot of folks that are working on that. And part of working the reliability is really that third point. It's, you can't do it without the material system. To think of additive, especially today, as a supply chain of three different elements, the design, the machine, and the material, um, you're just not gonna make it. Uh, the material is much more uh, of a marriage to a machine to the uh, to the added machine than, than any other material is to any other metal cutting or metal forming machine. Um, it, it's incredible the uh, the sensitivity, the process sensitivity. So you know it's almost to the point. I know back at uh, back at Northrop Grumman we were doing a, a lot of B basis analysis and trying to get some data um, to qualify some parts, and we had to lock down the spec to only two machines in the United States to, to could actually run the material to get the parts that we needed. 
um, because we lost reliability once we moved away from those two machines. Those two machines took about six to eight months to get ready to even have the B basis data test run on them. Um, so yeah, if you, if you can get that material, and it was, by the way, uh, primarily due to the uh, behaviors of the material. Uh, and a lot's going on in the simulation world to understand material flow, uh, you know, different different crystallizations, phases, different shapes, diam diameters, you know, all these different things. There's tons of confidence curves for each one of those, but if you know stats, uh, you know, it, it's basically that percentage times that percentage times that percentage times that percentage of each of those variables that have a percentage of its own 95% confidence curve. At the end of the day, you end up in the 20 and 30% reliability uh, range, which which is not industrial by anybody's um, sense. So, how does that material advance with the machine tool, or the, with the machine? How, how does that material go lockstep? How do we accommodate with sensors and other types of technologies that that allow us to see what's going on, change real in real time, and then know for a fact that when I push this button, the material is going to react this way to this energy source, and I'm going to get the geometry and the density and all these great features I need out of that part. And that's just a tall claim right now. Um, but without that supply chain linking together like a marriage, without having that entire machine and process being more reliable, and, and especially not having the standards in place to do all this stuff, uh, you come off the hype curve and you stay down uh, with additive. Luckily, we're seeing some people make and uh, ask some really – smart industrial questions uh, and challenge additive as a technology and a lot of folks around the, the globe are starting to do a lot more of these types of things so uh, at the end of the day will it outlive it uh, yes i do i believe so um but not without those three things happening and that's kind of the the hype for me and you know we uh we talk about bottlenecks sometimes and and, and really for me the, the reason this is even first is because without those three things i, I there's some there's some great science and some great research going on, that, no doubt. And those papers, I'm not doubting the validity of the claims and the conclusions. The problem is how do you take that science and, and the data you find and then correlate that even more back to the business stuff? And we'll get into that in a little bit. But you know, to say that the machine will change the world is a great claim. If you scope down what your world <laughs> really means, sure, it, it certainly will and will do so in a quick fashion. Um, but if you try to compare it to the entire manufacturing industry universe, if you will, today, that's a very small ripple in a very big pond, and it's just tough. So I don't say that to dismiss the technology. I say that to be sure when you guys are going through the classes and you're understanding more about the nuances, um, there, there's a lot more to consider than just the science, to be quite honest, to get this technology to be up at par so that everybody can start to use it like everyone claims they want to, right? Uh, so as you go this progress, there's many ways that you can slow down to a point where you become stale and installed. Uh, there's a point where you can accelerate too fast and you burn out. But there's also another area, and that's what I call derailing. In other words, you continue to make progress but you've missed the goal. You're not. You're no longer on your track. You're you're off the track doing other things, still progressing, right? So that's the science part. If too many basic science questions go down one particular path, without having some linkage back to other scientific findings and commercial business case ends as the end, um, you get great science, but you don't have the innovation that the globe is looking for. You know, you talk about the being the big disruptor, and it is. There's no doubt. Uh, but how is it disruptive as a business model? Well, and they'll start telling you, oh, I can reduce design time. I can do this. I can reduce my my tooling, my fixturing. I now have uh, one to two components versus 10 to 20 of assemblies. And, and that's all true. But the problem is if you're just doing that without the link back to the business problem you're solving, then it's it's good for you, it's good for your degree. But how does that stuff get outside of the university and outside of your head for just the degree? Um, and that's where a lot of industry is really, and I, I got to tip my hat to industry. They're, they're starting to do a lot more of this. They're not where they need to be, but but they're getting close. And that's providing that kind of goal to the universities. So NSF is great. They, they have to get through that basic research, TRL, uh, technology readiness level, manufacturing readiness levels, one through three. That, that's what they should be doing. 
But when you have an industry come in and say, I see where you're going with that. And did you know if you just did this or if you made it this much more reliable or dense or multifunctional in this area, I've got a business case. And, and by the way, you know, that kind of stuff usually lends into internships and full-time employment and, and all this other good stuff, not just the, the positive bump to GDP. Um, but another thing that people tend to forget is that they think additive and they think only additive, uh, or they think additive and they think about the seven ASTM defined processes, and, and that's fine, but additive as a standalone is not gonna do much, uh, it, not yet. I'd love to see it where it is the, the sole thing and you, and you go and you do, and there's lots of reasons why um, you could in some cases do that. And there's lots of reasons why you, you may not. Um, I think if anyone has ever printed a part, polymer or metal, uh, you know, the surface finish is an obvious thing, and we, we can talk, you know, until the cows come home about the, the stress, you know, uh, areas and, and the, what you lose in functionality because of some of the, um, I'll call it the chad, but the non-spherical surf or non-spherical uh, particulates and then the not a very clean surface finish, we'll say at least. But what does that mean as far as the rest of the technology world? Well, people say, well, sure, we'll go. Um, we can polish, we, you know. We we can go and sand. We can do this. We can do that. We can put on a machine tool. We can do all this stuff. Um, but but when you look at the dollar and uh, the cost and the time to add all that stuff up, your candidate list of parts greatly decrease. And I and I know you've you've talked to some folks before me, so that's pr that's not news. So let me talk about it from this perspective. When I've been around different shops and I've gone through and talked to the Northrops and the Lockheeds, but I've also talked to small tool and die shops. Um, a lot of folks that support local regions and that's it. They've got one customer and you know, whoever it might be. And um, it's it's interesting, the ones who are successful with additive, and, and it seems to be the case now as it was about five or six years ago, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's about a three to one ratio. There's about three, I'll call them traditional manufacturing technologies for every piece of uh, additive technology, regardless of what process the additive technology happens to be, polymers or metals. Um, it's really wild. Let's see, <laughs> they've got some that are already set up there for uh, the finishing. Some are already set up for some other things to make more of a uh, automated cell with some additive equipment. But, but either way you look at it, it always ends up being this three to one. And that's kind of interesting. So those folks who have made the most out of additive haven't made it out of additive alone. And that's kind of an interesting takeaway if you think about that. So if you think, pe most people will call additive accurately a tool, and it is for your tool belt, but to really think about what you can do in productivity with additive and with the other complements of other technologies is, is I think, essential and, and necessary. And um, so if people need to think about that. The more people always just look at additive alone, uh, you know, I think you're going to lose a lot, especially out in, uh, in industry. That's not to say there's not tails of the curve that you could, right? Uh, but for the most part. And um, you know, I've got a little phrase there, the tail wagging the dog. Um, I'm not sure what interest you guys in additive in general, as far as uh, your first mention of it or your first awareness or your first usage with it, or, you know, on a machine. But uh, most folks these days, if I talk to them, it's, it's usually from the maker fairs. Uh, it's folks who have you know, printed pencils or, you know, some, some gadgets and some geometries. And they've got this maker fair uh, mindset, but they also have a maker fair uh, I guess I'll say resource in their head. They're thinking in the constraints and, and the enabling factor, uh, factors of it, but really thinking about it from a maker standpoint. Where that is awesome is in the design side. Quickly get ideas out of your head into, onto your hand. You can look at things, they're tangible, you can do stuff with it. The problem is, could be, I should say, if you let the tail the maker mentality, wag the entire industrial dog of additive, uh, you miss a lot of the questions we talked about on the first chart. So you you don't think about reliability of the machine because it cost, it's so cheap, I'll just you know print 100 to get the 50, you know print the 10 to get the five, print the four to get the two, whatever the, those are all 50% ratios. But I mean, there's, I think in Northrop we were, we were still making a value case on the business side for a particular part being made six times to fly two. <laughs> so we had a bed of six parks and we flew two and it still made a business case. So it's, but if you, if you continue to think that, and that's where you start to put your boundaries is that, is that I can always make X number and, you know, cause I only need so many, 
you're not really pushing yourself in the right area to go exercise that optimal mode of what additive can give you. And, um, and that's tough. And so, you know, and it's tough with the, with the tail and the dog because you don't, you really don't want to discount people who have that maker mentality and are doing things on their own and have the gadgets and the tools because that's really the creativity innovation you want. You just want to make sure that that world isn't the only world that directs what they think additive could or should do and, and that it's directly translatable to an industrial machine with uh, higher grade polymers or metals or ceramics and all the other different types of composite matrix that might be around that can be that can be a challenge right that can be a challenge um on the last of the, of the bullets is you know it's this kind of reality check in um a lot of people in industry and, and and if you talk to if you go to conferences for example you might hear from a chief technology officer or even a, a plant manager um and they might be in a medium to even a large business and they're talking about how you know additive is going to do all this stuff and it's and it's like it's again like it's that one that one technology and, and, and once you drop it in the pond it's not it's not small waves that propagate out it's huge tidal waves that propagate out and um the, the fact is it, it it it's not um not yet not yet but there is some kind of uh an interesting goal you could say uh, for the folks who make additive machines and make a lot of money on additive services and if you look at today's market let's go back to the machine tool comparable and control system comparable there it's about a nine billion dollar market annually so that's 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 sold goods so that's nine billion in revenue sold manufacturing i'm sorry machine tool and control system goods so hardware and so in the software it's included and that $9 billion market makes a GDP, so your big pool, your big ocean, an impact of $1.99 trillion of what we call U.S. value-add manufacturing. That's the stuff on the right. That's your planes and automobiles and heavy equipment and appliances and energy and food and all these different things. And uh, you know that's, that's a really small, small percentage for the impact that it makes. The interesting thing about that statement, nine billion, that impacts 1.99 trillion, is that I think I just saw the latest Terry Wooler's report, and I think they're a year back. So I think when 15's report, which is what we have now, is based was effectively 14's dollars. Um, the the equipment side, so not the services of you know not revenues of parts made additively sold, but but the equipment itself and the materials to get that machine to make something, right? So that stuff uh, was just at 1.2 billion and even with some of the great increases in revenues that we, we've seen over the last few years and i think in general it's in the 25 to 30 percent depending on which which data you look at um, that takes a long time to get close to nine billion um, and an interesting thing i think you add another i think it was uh two i think it ends up being 1.6 ish billion so i think there was um 400 million plus another 600 for the so basically about a billion of that would be on the revenues from parts made with additive equipment but i'm talking 1.2 billion is is the equipment itself so you kind of have this this reality check of oh additive is is everything we're gonna we're gonna pour into we're gonna get these machines out and, and the material systems are going to improve we're gonna make all these parts and we're just gonna take over the world of manufacturing and and the reality today the reality today is that it, it's not even really close um and in the machine tool and control system world it took a while to get to nine billion now what would be a, a more interesting thing to watch is how quickly because i think it, i still think ad is going to skyrocket and it's going to be a much bigger portion of uh and in fact it's going to be a significant number of, of the nine billion i believe i don't know terry has some numbers that pretty pretty uh pretty high numbers for 2020 and, and 2025 but uh, i don't think he's too far off but the fact of it is today is it's really a small small part of all the manufacturing technology that's around and it's only affecting a very small small part of that 1.99 trillion um now i will caveat this those are global numbers I mean, i'm sorry those are us numbers um but when you extrapolate out to the globe 
uh, the U.S. is about 20% of that market. So if you just kind of wanted to play some more numbers and bigger numbers, uh, when you extrapolate that sentence out, it, it, it's about 20% of the overall uh, global GDP versus what the U.S. makes in manufacturing tech or the world makes in manufacturing technology to the world's make of GDP. So just a little bit of an economic look about what, what additive really has for us today and and kind of where it's going. And, and an interesting thought we had, we just had to respond to a Department of Defense request for information and they're trying to do another institute. And this other institute could be focused on machine tools and control systems, could be on robotics, soft and adaptive robotics, it could be on cybersecurity and some other different things. But when AMT went and queried all of our board members and members and some DOD and, and Siemens and Caterpillar and those types of folks, I think it ended up being about 50 people uh, an interesting thing happened. We, the RFI had listed a whole lot of stuff, and I, and I maybe go back and look at this because I said, what of, of all the top things that we saw, so we mean AMT with our committees and board and the folks at the workshop, so it's 50-some people. Of all the things, and the things were about 12 different things, what were the highlights from all of those different sources? And, and those, that's what I highlighted in yellow. So they started, and there's a link back to additive, so stay with me. <laughs> the state of the art, they said, we need to improve the human data mine. You know, it needs to be more intuitive. It has to be real time. It has to look more like a game, less buttons. And, and we need to have more integrated sensors and we need to have more integrated automation. Um, and we need to have that hybrid technology. We have additive and subtractive machines, but that needs to go throughout. You know, let's include the fabrication inspection and all this other stuff and advanced work holding and tooling. And then we got into the cyber physical and also the integrated open source connectivity, which I'll go into just for two minutes here in a second. But all of those top three things, there is nothing in that area that is not on American Make's roadmap for additive. The control system, whether it's simulation, design to simulation, shortening the digital thread so that once you get everything from a design, it's, it's a one button push translated out from STL or if you're going different file formats now, there's a couple of them out there, um, to your machine, the machine reads it right and, and you get your, your part going and everybody is integrating sensors across the board. And they're trying to do it because they realize the sensitive nature of the process within additive, especially in some of the thermal uh, uh, build chambers with, with the polymers and the lasers. You know, it's a very interesting dynamic, well, for metals for that matter too. Um, and the automation side. So now we're trying to figure out with additive, how do you, if you get a part bed and you got a cake of parts in it, how do you quickly get that hot cake out break out the parts, go off to the, the post-processing that you need to do, get things back into the machine, get it ready to go and hit start as soon as possible. And they realize you can't do that without automation. So that integrated automation is already starting to look in additive the same way that people are asking for integrated automation to be applied in the machine tool world. I mean, number three is a bit self-evident, but the, you know, and of course additive takes care of the advanced tooling work holding by saying, hey, we'll just, you know, if you follow anything coming out of NC State, we'll just include that in the process so that when you create your additive part, it already has the fixturing already there and we can just throw it into a CNC and we're, and we're good to go. Last thing I'll say, and then I'll kind of stop and, and take a break and take any questions. Um, it's been a lot. I understand that. It's been this integrated open source connectivity and maybe open source is too strong. Let me say open architecture connectivity. So in the beginning, I talked about standards and how standards need to talk to one another and interface because they, they stretch the breadth of, of everything from process to materials to machines and equipment and then data itself. Um, people keep talking about the industrial Internet of Things and they talk about digital manufacturing and all the things that they talk about are predicated on one key thing, and that's the data itself. And if you have a bunch of proprietary sources giving you proprietary data in a stream, you spend a lot of time making proprietary stuff unproprietary so that you can couple it with the other piece of equipment that probably that first manufacturer doesn't make anyway and to make that digital thread connect. And what we're realizing is that, you know, with standards like MT Connect, which we actually run out of uh, AMT, but OPC UA, Unified Architecture, if you're familiar with that, a lot of these industry standards start to come up because they realize this. They realize that even on a particular piece of machine to get data off of it, you need standards to define the data type, data communication protocol, leverage other standards like TCP IP, they're already there. Use XML so it's extensible and it's rich. And you can you can capture a lot more data, but all this industrial internet of things and digital manufacturing, which additive gets placed in quite often now, um, they all stop short of talking about that real practical problem at the business end. And that is, how do you get the data? How do you connect to the data? And how does the data become, information become knowledge, right? Um, 
so anyway, re really interesting area to be in additive, just being in a classroom today and, and hearing from different folks talk about it from different perspectives. And um, you know, this is probably a little bit different salt than you've had on some of your other talks, but uh, from my industry side of where we're seeing the challenges of additive being adopted and becoming more pervasive are really uh, in those kinds of areas that we talked about today. So I'll, you know, um, Terry, I'll, I'm gonna come out of this for a second. I don't know if, you still have my charts up, right? If, if I need, I can stop sharing or no? Yeah, you're good? Uh, you're, I, I, we're good. So, okay, so. Uh, any question? I mean, that's a ton, dude, so. <laughs> I can, I can imagine some. I around. do have a question. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, what's your definition about a, a digital manufacturing? What, yes. What are the challenge? Uh, what's what's the what is the trend? Yeah, got so, it. No, great great question too. So we track that quite a bit, um, and it, and it really depends, unfortunately, uh, like many things in engineering. It depends on where you are on the globe when you ask about digital manufacturing. If you ask Germany, they quickly say it's that which enables Industry 4.0, which kind of begs the question, what is Industry 4.0? If you ask in the United States, they say it's anything that is a one or a zero, or it's anything that makes me smart, even though digital is just an element of smart manufacturing. And I would, I would, I would couch it like this. You know, digital manufacturing, I mean, quite honestly, by definition, needs to be a one or a zero, but it's more about that. It's, it's more that it's the manufacturing where you – you're leveraging and exploiting the digital. So the digital data gives you two things. You know, it can give you very discrete points, which helps with algorithms, uh, but it also gives you capacity and memory. You can do, you can pack a lot of that away and you can do a lot of processing, hopefully closer to real time than not. We've been following a lot of the high performance computing and how, if you guys follow some of that, the, uh, the controllers these days are really starting to use the graphical processing units, GPUs over CPUs. But as you get in that domain uh, and you start manipulating the ones and the zeros and you start worrying about things like space and capacity and parallel processing, to me, that's digital manufacturing. Um, doesn't mean you can't do a hand lathe, capture some data, run some analytics in the back room and, and, and still say you're in digital manufacturing. I, I don't think that every piece of your process has to be digitized. I just think it means you need to exploit where you can the, the digital nature of a one and a zero. Uh, and the trend, let me answer that too. Uh, I gave you a little bit of the answer. We certainly are seeing a trend uh, in the control world to move away from G-code. It's not quite getting the, the industrial ground, but the, some of the leading universities are starting to do that and also the different file formats for uh, some of the additive stuff. But what, one of the biggest trends we're seeing um, is on the processing side. So it's, it's GPUs to move more towards parallel processing. So that allows you, why is parallel processing interesting? Um, one of the hardest things in additive is to capture the data, run an equation, compare it, analyze it, produce the output back into the system so that you have an in-situ correction. Um, you know, at best, I think I've seen tens of milliseconds, a um, couple milliseconds. The problem is when you're dealing with lasers and frequencies and where they are, and, and even in some other extrusion areas, um, that feedback loop has to be in a duration of nanoseconds. You you might be able to get by with a you know 500 nanosecond world, but you really need to be closer to the two, the one, if not sub 100 nanoseconds to really have an in situ process. Um, and so where we're choked up today are two areas. The controller on the processing side, A, so a lot of people are still CPU, even with dual core. No one knows how to really program that in the controller world at, at, a, at scale that makes sense. Um, but also, if you were able to uh, increase the memory and make these controllers look more like industrial PCs at a minimum, uh, you can localize those algorithms. You can, and I mean localize not at the controller, but localize it at the source of energy or the source of the, the mechanisms and the actuation. Um, if you can embed sensors and intelligence the same way we're embedding sensing and processing in robotics, we're going to be a whole lot better off in the additive world to work on the in-situ quality. Um, but we're nowhere there yet. <laughs> we're, but the trend is to move more towards parallel processing. A lot of that's in the GPU, away from the CPU. And we're starting to see now people start talking about embedding intelligence and embedding um, some of the uh, the processing at the point of actuation and the point of energy and not just centrally on a controller. So 
interesting things to follow. Those are just emerging. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Got one. Yeah, go for it. Uh, you were uh, talking about the height curve of yeah. the uh, additive. Uh, what would you say is like a, a red flag of when that curve is sort of starting to decline? Uh. Uh, it's actually much like the some marketing folks would tell you it's it's very quantitative and you could it's very predictable um, you can you can almost count the number of magazine headlines it's almost as if you go to Google Analytics and did some of this stuff um, you can check headlines you can check magazine covers and the moment you get to about a 30 percent to 40 percent decline from what you just were at that's this that's this happening Right. You kind of you're increasing, increasing your plateau just for a few you know, months, maybe. And once you get 30 to 40 percent decrease from that previous point, almost every time, that's when your full curve starts coming down. And it won't always go as deep. Each each technology and actually whatever you're talking about in the media has a different bottom. But generally, when you get about 30 to 40 percent of that and you just track this over the Google Analytics, that's about where you go. You know what? We're coming down off that hype curve. And I think it was. Um, Gardner Media and Gartner, G-A-R-T-N-E-R, Gartner, uh, had a couple different surveys that went out, and they sort of showed that that hype curve was kind of happened, and it was in that 30 to 40 percent decline of headlines. <laughs> as odd as that sounds, and is so Madison Avenue, New York marketing as that sounds, it, it, it tends to be true. Cool. All right, anything else? Thank you very much, Tim. All right, guys, you got it. Enjoy the class. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.